called to order. It is being videotaped at the office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, for distribution to the community TV stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. Uh, we recognize the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair, and we just ask that all questions and comments be directed to the chair, and that everybody act uh, very nicely. And please come up to the to the dias and use the microphone if you wish to speak. Um, with that, I think Phil, are you going to be the board secretary yet yes, again? I'm the board secretary. Okay. From now uh, on. All right. Thank you. And we have Karen Herrick here from the FinCom. Hello, Karen. I'm sitting in the dark. Thank you. We have a couple of members of the public here, which is nice to see. Um, and with that, um, we have any comment from the cab or um, liaisons at this time before we get to the report from the meeting we just had. So any public comment, any cab comment? Jason, no. Sorry, I did not introduce Jason Small from North Reading, cab rep. Liaisons to the RMLD. So with that, we'll move to the report from the meeting that just occurred, um, the CAB meeting. Um, and Tom, do you want to give the report briefly on the gist of what was said at the CAB meeting? Yes, I think I'll be brief because I think some of the items are on our agenda as we see them coming. So since we're having meetings back to back, so uh, in the summary uh, pieces, so. Uh, Colleen, as general manager, gave an update on the recent ransomware security intrusion, which we'll be talking about. Also, the uh, <coughs> recent uh, introduction of uh, cell technology attachments to phones and what the implications are that for RMLD and others. And that was also the subject of the NEPA legislative rally, which Colleen attended, and we'll be reporting on that. And uh, two other items from uh, the general manager, one around the smart microgrid, and there'll be a presentation forthcoming. So we'll get to see a little more detail on that in an upcoming meeting. And <coughs> as the board and I think others may have seen, there's been a uh, focus on uh, community shared solar, and Colleen is in the process of collecting uh, uh, numerous sites uh, within the served communities that could be candidates for solar, and we'll be uh, soliciting has solicited uh, inputs, uh, which uh, will be received over the next couple of months. Uh, we also uh, got a nice presentation on energy position and resource update by... Which we will see shortly. Yes. Um, and um, from Zach, and also uh, we spent some time discussing the town payment to Reading, and the cab provided their feedback, which was part of the uh, request from the board at our last meeting. And I think that was uh, essence. Anything you want to add, uh, Jason? No, I think that covers it. Um, okay. I think it's worth just getting into that a little bit more in that we had um, we had some correspondence from the select Reading Select Board proposing some tweaks to the, what we had put forward. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, and we thank the Select Board, Mark Doxer, for, for taking the time to do that. Um, the basic tweak that the, that the town of Reading put forward was suggesting that the factor for determining the town payment should be based on revenue versus kilowatt hour sales. That was sort of the gist of it. Uh, that's not the, the detail. Um, and the feedback from the cab was they had some concerns about doing that. And Jason, if you would like to state what you stated in the meeting just now, just to kind of, so it's coming from you, okay. please do. So. Okay, uh, the concern the, the cab had around tying uh, town payment to uh, revenue was that one of the main ways to increase revenue for Reading Municipal would be through uh, rate adjustments. Right. Um, so um, when considering a rate adjustment to cover whatever it is that they need to cover, whether it's co the cost of service or uh, to transfer funds into the capital plan to cover capital costs, they would have to then take consider the amount of that money that would then be uh, transferred to the town of Reading in the payment form. So that would add to maybe any potential uh, rate increase to cover whatever it is that they're trying to get. And then because Reading serves four, uh, three other communities outside of Reading, um, the rate payers in those communities would in effect also be paying to increase the payment to the town of Reading. And there's uh, just, we're concerned with that um, methodology and having that tied back. So that's the concern from the other communities, and that was what was discussed. Thank you, Jason. And I think uh, George Hooper from Wilmington concurred, and um, 
so I just thought it was good to just get that into this meeting, given the importance of the issue. You know, we're going to continue to, to study this. You know, we're not taking any action tonight, but I just wanted to get it out in the main meeting. And uh, Colleen also indicated that she's going to work on her own sort of a memo about, about this new option and, and um, hopefully next week be able to kind of have that some expertise from the general manager and, and Wendy on the topic and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue the discussions at the, at the March meeting. Um, Mr. Chair, can I kind of expand on what Jason said? Please. I have a presentation. I, I got stuck in traffic and I've been kind of busy all day. Yep. So I don't know if anybody wants to what is this now? Pass, pass it down. This is kind of the financial structure. This I bring this out occasionally. Okay. I do have a uh, PowerPoint. You want this? I don't know if you can. You get the PowerPoint on? I don't want to cause any trouble. No, no trouble. <laughs> um, so I think what, what Phil's getting at here, he's he's giving kind of a the 101 on how this works. How this works. And um, Phil's been around a while on the board. Bring this out occasionally. And so. It's the PowerPoint. That's it. Those are accurate numbers as of. That's actually as of market close on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. okay. so you don't actually to make 8%, but this is worst case scenario, I guess. I only see one, one number zero. It's just saying that whatever it is, it's zero. Bill, your parent, you parents would be proud, uh, yeah. as former parents teachers, right? See, I even got the, I even got the good logo here. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Phil has new glasses, by the way. I can't, I can't say that I actually, I copied this from somebody here at the department, so go to the next page. Phil, uh, can people hear you, Phil? You wanna, why don't okay, you sit okay. down so they can hear you at okay. the microphone there? That's fine. Okay. So basically what I've got here is this is kind of the financial structure of the RMLD, as you see here. So the first line is the rates. So you can see that we, we have the rates, and I put the fuel charge over on the right-hand side because that's an in and out. So when people talk about basing it on revenue, I'm not sure they understand that you know the fuel charge is separate. That's that may not that you know because that's an in and out thing. And Colleen, you correct me if I say anything wrong, okay? <laughs> and then from there comes the power cost, then comes the operating costs, and then the depreciation fund, which is, which is one of the sources of capital. Now, there's some other items that come in, so you see the ones, the positive. Then you've got the, 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 uh, the net here. Then comes the above-the-line payment. This is the payment that was agreed to under the 20-year agreement, where it is 2% of the net plan and divided among the towns based upon kilowatt usage in each town for the previous year on that. Now, that comes down at this point to the bottom line, the eight percent. Now, you know, and then from there goes the payment to the town. There's something called loss disposal that goes through here, and then also the addition to the capital. So, to, to expand on Jason's point, if you're trying to increase the bottom number here, you've got to increase the rates. So, really, you know, my opinion, and I'll state my opinion is is I think you really got to base the payment on kilowatt hours. I don't think, you know, I understand people understand business. This is a different type of business here. You know, we're not, we're not Amazon. We're not IBM. We're not even analog. <laughs> she got it. <laughs> um, so this is a different structure that people got to be aware of. And I'm not sure, you know, the people out there understand the business structure here and how everything works. This is not a typical business. I read, you know, Mark's thing about, you know, the bottom line increasing because the additional, the additional, uh, the additional capital, which is fine. But you got to remember where that number comes from, is got to be put into the rates. So if we base it on the revenue, then we really we have to raise rates. And you know that's, you know, I'm I'm a taxpayer. I pay my electric bill. You know, I don't want to see, you know, personal opinion, you raise the race, you're, you're, you're giving me a hidden tax increase. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Phil. So I think, you know, 
the just to wrap this topic up and we don't then need to talk about um, item six because we're kind of already talking about it is that there is a there is a consensus emerging around keeping the payment the below the line payment you know where where it is and with some type of factor on it it's just what does that formula look like is what we're working on here there's not any big sort of radical difference between any of us on the magnitude uh, of the payment or the fact that it could go up with with some type of factor I think unless somebody corrects me if I'm wrong we're pretty close to a solution here um, and we're going to bring it bring it to the next meeting keep the conversation going at the next meeting um, and hopefully get this wrapped up and we can move on to other other collaborations and, and topics Dave can I ask a question please with the proposal to tie it to revenue because we were we've been talking more about tie it to kilowatt hour sales if you tie it to revenue like Phil you were just describing and Jason mm -hmm. too if there's a shock to the cost of power for example say it's an extreme and the power goes up by it doubles and we have to charge every ratepayer is paying twice as much instead of a hundred dollars a month they're paying 200 and of course the commercial payers would have to pay much more would that mean that would have to double the payment to the town under that model is that would it be a double whammy so people would double their their electric bill go up by double, and then they'd be would have to work into the rates an additional two and a half billion dollars. Is that what's is that what's yeah? Being because proposed? if if power supply goes up, right. the costs go up. You have to raise the rate to c recover those costs. Right. So essentially, revenue goes up, but you didn't make the revenue based on that you sold more kilowatt hours. You made the revenue because you had to increase your rate to cover your costs. Right. So it would be a double whammy for the rate payer. And that's yeah, and that's if, if if energy costs go up by some yeah. significant amount, if power goes up. Yep. Yes, and I think we also that 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 point came up in the cab meeting, and it sort of goes to what Jason's uh, point was. I think yeah, right. it kind of adds another di another dimension to it. Yeah. Uh, he he mentioned in the meeting about in the context if you had to have a big capital plan and raise rates, right? But that that scenario also would. Okay, with that, I don't want to. We're good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me. Nope. Yeah, okay. Karen, please, just please come up and identify yourself and mm -hmm. sit at the microphone so people mm -hmm. on TV can. You know, the reason we don't have so many people here is because of the coronavirus, so we want to make sure for all the people <laughs> that are watching at home instead of the usual crowd. Okay, it's not good. okay go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yep. Karen Herrick, um, Nine Dividends Reading, um, liaison to the Finance Committee. Um, and this uh, potential rate shock, th that is why there's a rate stabilization fund, which is seven or eight million dollars. Is that is that what that fund would be used for if we were going to have a rate shock? I just want to make sure I understand. Well, it would depend on the scenario, but yeah. you know, six million dollars divided by twenty nine thousand customers for, a, you know, a, a, a long term incident of rate inc of of power cost increase would go away very quickly. Okay, and we haven't had one. I'm just I'm just trying to understand the model. We haven't one had one since the 70s, but there's so you've corrected me. There's six million dollars there, you, but you guys have put a rate stabilization fund in place for a shock to the system. That's what it's used for. Yeah. Right now, it's a little bit higher than the policy, but if you look at your six-year budget, yeah. you'll see that the next two rate increases are subsidized by getting the rate stabilization back down to the policy-driven number. Um, okay. That's in your six-year plan that you've gotten a copy of. Yeah. So that, okay. that amount of money will go down to what? By a couple million? I think it's like $6.5 million plus or minus 500000 I think that's what the policy says. Okay, just wanted to understand that that was the fund we were talking about. Thank you. Okay, uh, minutes. Ready for the uh, Phil, do you want the motion for item minutes. 7? Okay. Yeah. I'll move that the board approve the meeting minutes of October 17, 2019, and November 21st, 2019, and the recommendation of the general manager. Yeah. We have a second. Second. Okay, all in favor? And by the way, um, I neglected to mention that was 4 that, that that John is traveling, John Stempek. Now, this is a little embarrassing, but did he mean to be here remotely? <laughs> did that? Okay. Not going to be here remotely. Okay. He said there wasn't a phone on the yeah, beach where he's, where he's yeah. at right now.
Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss. <laughs> I'm sure he would have texted one of us by now. Yeah. <laughs> just text him to make sure. Um, but yeah, so that's why we're four tonight. John is um, is is away on on urgent urgent business. Okay. Uh, and Colleen, we your report. Yeah. My report. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, can we go a little bit out of order, if that's all right? Sure. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about the um, ransomware um, attack. Uh, we got some questions in from the town of Wilmington, so I'll just go through those very quickly. Um, I I want I'm. I'm trying to be as clear and transparent as I can, but considering that these type of cyber attacks, um, you know, can do more damage when you release specifics, um, I think what we'll do is I'll give kind of a, a general where we are, and then uh, the IT division has said that basically in another couple of weeks we can provide a little bit more information. We don't want to antagonize any anybody, uh, any of the bots or, or hackers or anything. So uh, the first question was, how did the ransom attack occur? Uh, simple email link click can allow a ransomware attack. Uh, ransomware attacks are growing and have hit millions of companies all over the world. Hackers can be both human and bots, or both. The RMLD, with support of the outside IT cyber recovery consultant, is still investigating the origin and the breadth of the attack. While progress is being made, there's a risk associated with prematurely releasing specific information in the public forum while the investigation recovery is ongoing. Therefore, we cannot provide any more details on that at this time. I will tell you that the RMLD backs up its systems daily as a matter of IT protocol. Second question, what has been the impact on customers? There was no impact to the electric system or the delivery of electricity. At this time, there's no indication that customer data was compromised. Bill payment functionality was unaffected. Customer service representatives are advising customers to put input their credit cards via invoice cloud, uh, which is automated phone line uh, or online directly in lieu of providing payment information over the phone to the RMLD customer service. Cash Colleen, check. can I ask, is that always been the case, what you just said? It has always been the okay. case, and, and you know, as, as I'm looking at what I wrote, Probably in part of our recovery system, that's probably should be the way we do it going forward anyways, right? Right there, there's a little bit of a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, cash and checks are being accepted as usual, and discount dates will be on it. Uh, question number three, what steps are being taken to correct the problem? An, eight, an IT consultant has been hired to assist the RMLD in sweeping all of its IT infrastructure to ensure that everything is clean before reconnecting its systems. Press releases and customer instructions on payments were sent out via newspaper, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and I did find an email. We kind of we sent an email to the board, the cab, and all the town managers that went out. Um, but because we were going so fast, um, it just referenced uh, the same press release that went out. But we did send an email to, to all of the town managers and administrators. Um, what's uh, what? Question number four, what measures will be put in place to reduce the chance of a similar incident occurring? The RMLD is working to achieve normal business with all its backup systems. The IT consultant will assist the RMLD with the root cause analysis of the incident and its recovery efforts. As well, the consultant will assess the system and provide critical input to the RMLD for its recovery plan through a series of these IT assessments. Technology changes by the hour, cyber attacks and hacking technology changes by the hour. Assessments to ensure that the latest malware and virus protection is installed is critical, and the frequency of such assessments will be included in this recommended RMLD cybersecurity recovery plan. The RMLD was in the process of developing its cybersecurity plan for its overall IT infrastructure, as we already had in place its electric system cybersecurity plan was already in place as required by NERC. The RMLD is fortunate to have its IT team make, take immediate steps on Friday. Um, Friday cyber infiltration to isolate the electric system, customer information vendors, and to contact qualified IT recovery consultant. So it's important to know that Friday, we, we, we didn't really even know what was happening yet, right? So over the weekend, we were like, okay, we think this is what's happening, and that's when the emails to the, to the town managers and everything went out, and then we started to proceed from there because we really needed to try to figure out if this was even an attack. Do you know what I mean? So. Um, People have to understand that we had to take the time to, to do at least conduct the initial assessment. 
Uh, the RMLD is also in the process of transitioning a number of its systems to the cloud, which has a number of benefits, including enhanced security, efficiency, reduced hardware and associated maintenance costs. So I can give you another update. I'm going to put these uh, formally uh, in a reply to the Board of Selectmen. I will also send them to the other town managers and administrators, and then in another couple of weeks we'll send out an update. In the meantime, I was just talking to George. We'll probably ask if the IT um, uh, representative from Reading and some of the towns, and we can all meet and share information internally inside. And I think that'd be a good, a good working group to have a discussion. So, Ronnie, if you can take that action item to tr to set that up, that would be great. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, the APPA legislative uh, for NEPA. Um, I don't typically attend the APPA conference because that's a whole week of conference stuff. What we do is we go down with the NEPA legislative committee. There's usually about 15 of us, and we tar uh, go in and we meet with the, with the senators and representatives that, that uh, represent our service territory. This year's topics were the cell attachments. Um, as I mentioned before, the FCC issued an order at the end of September of 2018. Uh, it involves some shot clocks uh, for the towns. Um, we have some issues with safety and we have some issues with installation of double poles uh, should these requesters not want to co-locate on existing utility poles. So those are some of the discussions we had. Uh, the next issue was on hydro licensing. We have some older hydros. Uh, out in western Massachusetts and throughout New England that when it comes time for relicensing re there's a lot of red tape. We need those plants to stay online and we're asking our legislators if they can help us with getting, getting that done expeditiously. Um, and then we discussed the market volatility. You'll hear from Zach in a little bit about some of the volatility. Um, you know, we rely on knowing what our capacity costs are going to be so that we can have our demand response programs with our commercial customers for Shred the Peak. And with, with it yo-yoing up and down, it makes it very difficult for us to, um, you know, to come up with creative uh, programs for um, reducing peak usage, which we all know that during that peak times we have less, um, less efficient and more polluting plants that get turned online and we want to prevent that from, from happening. So those are kind of the key topics. The takeaway, I think, down there, there's so many people rotating in to talk to their representatives, is they do remember us when the ISO and uh, the IOUs are down there and, and uh, things are being changed. I think they remember that we're there and, and they, uh, they understand that we're not for profit and they, they know we want to protect our, our customers. So thank you for allowing me to represent the RMLD on that. Good. Um, I do want to mention and, and possibly ask that, you know, I was the, the key speaker for the uh, Next Terra uh, Public Power Summit, and that's for all municipalities and co-ops throughout the United States. Um, I spoke on smart uh, microgrids. Uh, I think it's a topic worth sharing, but it needs a little bit more time, and I'd asked if, we, if I can be put on the agenda to show you four or five slides of what we discussed about what the RMLD would like to plan and how that ties into the Massachusetts laws that I see uh, coming up in the near future. So if that's okay with you, sure. I can have Tracy can mark that down. Good. Uh, the small cell, just an update on that. Um, the uh, we're, we're just about done with our master template, uh, which you know the FCC uh, order mandated. Um, I'm supposed to be meeting with, because the elections are next Tuesday, I think the meeting with the town of Reading is on the 10th to go over the aesthetic cell policy. And I also have an email in with the other towns to talk to them about their aesthetic cell policies. Um, I have some examples that I've gotten that I will share with them um, along with the technical specifications so that we make sure that our contract and their aesthetic policy you know, gel and make sense. And we, we want to try to get any requesters to look to attaching to the electric poles so that we can minimize the amount of double poles that get put into the town. Question? Do we, no. um, is there, do we have or are you developing like a policy that we can, that we will need to vote on to kind of what the, what the RMLD's policy is on allowing such attachments and what the details are? Uh, no, not really.
really, I, I will share with you the, um, the master agreement. It would be no different from a master agreement attachment with, like Comcast and other people that are attached to our polls. Um, but I'll go over in a presentation what the technical specifications are. I'll go over uh, some of the details of the, of the town's cell policies because they may be different between all four towns. Um, but it's essentially an FCC order. Uh, we don't have a governing policy that addresses that, so uh, we're just following the order. We have to allow attachments without prejudice, uh, unless there's a safety capacity, a safety issue, or a capacity issue. So a capacity issue would be there's not enough room on the pole. A safety issue could be, um, you know, the pole is it gets hit all the time. It's on a corner, and we would work with the requester like Verizon Wireless or AT and T and say, okay, where's your dead spot? Let's try to work with that. You know, we're not going to want them attaching to any of the electric poles that have primary at the top, we'd rather them go to stub poles. So there'll be information in there like that. Um, there's also a lot of details about make ready and the engineers yep. and doing calculations, a lot of very dry information that you probably don't want to hear. Sure. No, just to clarify one thing, there's a lot of, there's not really a consensus that the FCC order does require municipal utilities to automatically allow this. So that's kind of a legal question that's, that's still being worked out. So it's not it's not just because the FCC wants to expedite doesn't mean we have to do any particular thing. So I do think the board should get a chance. Should there should be a policy, and that the board should have a chance to take a look at it. What 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 is the RMLD's policy on allowing, you know, antenna to be put on electric utility poles? And it's typically done at other MLPs. Um, so you're saying you're saying that the FCC's order does not apply to municipal I'm not saying that utilities. it doesn't I'm not saying it doesn't apply I'm saying there's two schools of thought on it and that it's a legal question that's going to take some time to unpack and the posture of some MLPs is to say you're not going to do it here and the posture of others as I've from I know from kind of my private work is that they're facilitating and generating policies that the attachers would follow but either way there's a policy that 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 the utility adopts okay, of what I, the policy is that we you know no. the utility. Yeah. I think we might be talking about the mm -hmm. same thing. You're calling it a policy, and I'm calling it a master attachment agreement. You're, you're you're describing the legal agreement to allow the attachment. Then before that would be a policy on whether whether we allow them at all, and if so, which poles do we allow them on, and under what circumstances do we allow them, and what's our process for interacting with our our municipal government um, so that. Because there could be many, many of these, you know, in the future, like hundreds of them all over the place, just in our territory. So I'm just, you know, it sounds like everything you're doing is on the right track. Just I think there should be a, a written policy. Like there's a lot of policies that we have for other things. So what is our policy? Yes, Tom. So I, I think I mentioned the CAD meeting. So it, it would seem to me that uh, that's helpful. But the, for me, the, the root issue is uh, what is going to be a lot because you know I gave the example of you know if a number of carriers are allowed to put poles. I mean, you, it's it's, right. it's comical. I mean, you could have a hundred poles on a small street. I yeah, mean, no, clearly I mean, that can't be. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm not saying I'm against. No, no, no. Yeah, no but I'm, I'm saying that's to your point. So yeah. it really requires more uh, informed in information and guidance right. from the FCC because the other aspect of it is if you start allowing. Five carriers. What if twenty more come along? And it There's a lot of and it. Then how do you say no to those? Then you exactly. have to say no to everyone, and then we have to add new poles because <laughs> we can't accommodate. All these details would be would be captured in a in a policy that describes what our posture is, what our process is. Yeah, but in this case, the policy may be until yeah. we, because we. I guess what I'm saying is the policy is important, but it's hard to do a complete policy because you don't really know what is allowed or not allowed. Can I make a suggestion? Please. Okay, so why don't I just get, you know, I already have the legal opinion. Why don't we discuss the legal opinion and make a decision at that point whether it, it, go, it becomes a governing policy. Um, and at the same time, we can go over uh, what exists in, in the template that we've written, like the highlights of the template. Um, because we, you know, 
what I think I hear you saying, I mean, we already have the town of Reading having, uh, you know, Tilson Tech invoking a shock clock on them to get a, a, an Correct. answer as to whether or not they are going to install three new poles in the town of Reading. Um, and, uh, right, because the FCC order does specifically address right away permits by local jurisdictions like towns. And they, they're in a tougher spot than you are. And, um, you know, they, they, do, they do have to, they can't just say no, you can't put something up in the right away. Um, unless it's an aesthetic consideration. So th it's complicated, and I'm just saying it's why there should be a unified policy and it should be there should be tight integration between utility and town on this, yeah, uh, with a policy that we have. And I agree with you, you know, if there's a stub pole and it's sitting there and that means that the town doesn't have to put up another pole, then, then, then the, we should have a thing where it goes on the stub pole. Um, that would be, make perfect sense. But either way, I just think there should be a policy. But anyway, I'm repeating myself here. So, anybody else, sir? I didn't mean for this to go on so long. That's okay. Um, it's exciting stuff. I, yeah. I just want to mention that we sent out a letter on the community solar to all of the towns yep. for a request for information by uh, May. Um, the letter includes a whole bunch of different rooftops that we think might be viable for solar. Um, there's a potential incentive for tax payment and in addition to lease payment if it's on a municipal rooftop and we've asked the towns if if you like what's in this list let us know if you want us to eliminate or add some let us know um, there's no obligation to the town but we'd like to get this out and in parallel with that we would also be including having that same vendor that we hire also look at uh, um, feasible commercial rooftops and land as well. Sounds good. So that's out there. And then the last one was a question that Phil had asked, and that was funding sources to rebuild the system for major damage. So um, I can put this into a white paper and send it out because it's, it's a lot of information, so I'm just going to go through the quick highlights. Right. Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. So when you have a catastrophic event in the town, and, and I could do a matrix of you know tiny small medium large and then blow your mind so we, we can't create a matrix that large so you know there's certain things that can be paid out of certain funds and then there's other things that are so large that it, it would go into other categories so let me tell you the avenues of how you would pay for certain catastrophes we have insurance okay uh, we have like up to 250 million dollars for certain occurrences okay I won't go through the deductibles and stuff like that and again I can send out a white, a white paper we have depreciation funds which are basically set by the board we had rate stabilization funds which are set by the board we have earnings from return on the plant which is up to your 8% I mean typically we don't make 8% because that would throw us out of the competitive um, mark but up to 8% in net plant so those re return earnings we can use Geo bond issues through the town, uh, MWEC pooled loan program, so we don't have to just go through geo bonds. We have other ways of borrowing money. Um, municipal light plant cooperative financial agreements is another way that we can borrow money. Emergency and disaster relief funding. Just a couple of key points. Issuance of geo bonds does not impact the town's borrowing limits. Um, the town's liability for RMLD costs and debt. Under the statutory scheme governing the RMLD, the town is insulated from liability for the cost of operation of the light plant, including the repayment of notes bonds, although legally debt for the RMLD plant incurred under General Law 44 is a municipal debt. The, by law, the RMLD has an obligation to repay all notes and interests on bonds as well as capital improvements and other costs to ensure that the rates are set at such levels to meet its obligations. So as I've said, you know, we by law have to cover our cost of production. So um, a scenario of something like that occurring would be everybody in the four towns moves out. That would be it, okay? And then even with that, I probably would be able to recover a lot of the power supply contracts if we moved to Ohio. I'd probably just take the debts over there. So they're, um, and again, I can, I can send this out. 
Accordingly, as long as the town owns and operates uh, the town, the, the RMLD owns and operates the electric system, the town would not be liable for any cost or debt associated with the plant. Because the RMLD is the exclusive electric service provider in its territory, RMLD's rates must cover its costs and debt obligations. The town can be assured that RMLD, not the town, would repay debt for repairing or rebuilding its system for ratepayer and revenues. Um, moreover, municipal light plants are excellent credit risk because they are not rate regulated. They can raise rates as often as every three months. They must set rates that are high enough to cover cost of production, which among other things includes the debt and other costs owed to its host municipality. They are fiscally independent from their host municipalities and their expenditures are not subject to second guessing by other municipal officers. They are not authorized to file for bankruptcy relief. So those are just some key points. I don't know, did that help uh, yeah, that yeah, question? Yeah, my, my point is I brought it for two reasons. First off, you know, climate change is coming, you know? I mean, all we would need is uh, a few years ago there was the ice storm out in Worcester that just basically leveled those systems out there and destroyed those systems that had to be rebuilt. So it's a possibility that it could happen here with the, with the, with the climate change. And the other, the other point is the fact that, you know, there are many people in town who believe that, you know, the town of Reading is guaranteeing the debt of this of the RMLD. And that's the point that Colleen just made. That it's so it not guaranteed. Yeah. So in that instance that you're talking about, like in Worcester, you know, our insurance company would cover the majority of it, but by law we have to raise the rates to recover it. It doesn't go to the town to repay it. We have to raise the rates and it has to be recovered through the rates. No one's responsible for the debt except us. Right. So again, I can put this in a white paper and send it out, and then everybody can be on the same page and ask questions, um, and I can do that for March if, you, if you'd like. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Okay. We can move on? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, are we done with eight? Are we into nine now? Uh, do we have to have a motion there? You want a motion, motion on what? On the, uh, the travel? Yeah. Sure. Mo move that the uh, Board of Commissioners approve Ms. Colleen, Ms. O'Brien's uh, travel to and attendance at the NEFA Legislative Rally in Washington, D.C. from February 24th to February 26th, 2020. So retroactive. It's okay. kind of, re well, you know what it is? I said I didn't, I wasn't going to go, but then Tom said somebody's got to go and nobody would go, so. So Tom, want to second that? Glad you went. I am glad I went. <laughs> I always love representing us, but. Tom, you second that? Mm -hmm. Motion uh, to fill this in. Okay. okay. All in favor? Okay. We got I have one more small thing, but because Tom all. made me go, yeah. um, can I have another month to use my vacation? Be yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So do you need a vote on that? I, I think so. Can I have till the end of May? Yeah. Can you? Why don't you put it on the next agenda? How about that? Or does it have to be done now? No. I'll have Tracy put it on the next agenda. Okay. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's okay. get on the agenda. Okay. Right. Have it be on the next meeting's agenda? Okay. Yeah. So now we move on to a point nine, right? So this is the goals that we, we all worked on at the last meeting, mm -hmm. okay? And then as discussed, we went through and saw what we all agreed on, and then we d decided that I and Colleen would render it down to a, a, a simple list, and, and the list that you see in the board book is the results of that, which Colleen has uh, approved and agrees with, and it is on, um, it's in the board book attachment three. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'll just briefly say what these are. These are goals that the board and Colleen are agreeing on for the 2020 calendar year. Under the general banner of our mission to provide reliable power at low cost, work toward a cleaner energy, energy supply, work closely with the towns we serve and capture potential revenue opportunities, anticipate, and anticipate changes, this, these are the goals. Okay, for the general manager, it is number one, to determine a site for the Wilmington substation and proceed with all those steps to to get this done, it's the top priority, and we all we all said that in our mm -hmm. matrices. The second was, and it's in line with with you know working closely with the town and to do our part, is to evaluate this campus in terms of a baseline study of the of the who owns the land, what are the land and building values, and what would the potential costs be to relocate. RMLD. The, what's driving this is a lot of conversation in the town about rethinking the site. So to feed into that process, we would develop data 
that could be helpful to everybody understanding the feasibility of that and over what time scales. That's number two. Um, and then Colleen, I don't know if you want to discuss the um, one of these is the master cell agreement that Colleen already we already talked a lot about that. Um, and you want to just talk about the third one a little bit, um, Colleen, the solar battery system impact study. Okay, so um, so when you're installing any kind of generation on electric lines, each of the feeders has a capacity limit. And so you can't just allow, you know, endless amounts of generation, whether it's solar or batteries, on those lines. So um, we're going to we're doing an impact study for all 27 feeders, and that will we'll we'll present that report, and then we'll incorporate those any limitations into our service requirements handbook. Um, and it's pretty significant because yep. it allows us for future planning and it, it, it also will allow our customers to understand whether or not they um, would be able to, you know, put anything back on the line or, or how that would work if they were considering solar or generation um, feedback. So great. And then the fifth one was to hold an electrification workshop. And this would be, I think, in line with a lot of the talk that's been um, a lot of the discussion around sustainability would be to move towards, you know, ideally a renewable, uh, more renewables in the supply, and then electrification, heat pumps as a source of um, of energy rather than gas. Um, this would be, and to move towards electric cars. So this is a workshop that that Colleen and and Chuck are, are pr preparing to explain to stakeholders, the towns, others, you know, what this is all about, what they can do, what our programs are. I will say. You know, RMLD's got programs for heat pumps, and a lot of municipal light plants do not. So I think our programs are, are really good, and, um, you know, Chuck and Colleen have done a great job at Hamid. And um, so I think there's a lot to be done, a lot of education to be done there, and I'm really happy that they're going to do this workshop. Um, so those are the five goals, substation, campus evaluation, the, the solar battery study that Colleen described, the master cell, small cell issues, and the electrification workshop. We also have two that were on many of our lists for the, for our board. What are goals for our board? And one was to define, you know, and this this is the staff is working very hard on this. Is you know what is our renewable policy? What are what are the percentages that we, with input from the community, would like to achieve? What are the definitions that we're using? Um, and to and to sort of determine those at the board level, and also to vote any position on any relevant proposed state policies in this area so that we're um, the board itself is helping you know with the public input providing uh, our views on on these policy big policy issues that are now before us um, that's one of the two goals the second is to simply review our mission statement and if needed um, you know and all these are with with Colleen's and staff's input potentially re review update uh, the mission statement of, of RMLD so that might have been characteristically long-winded, but that's the goals. Um, would anybody like to add or? I just have a question for Colleen, because I know we talked about uh, you have to run, do everything else, obviously. We have the other, you have to run this organization. Do you think adding five, these five goals is, would be, if we added this many, can we do all these? Is it, or we were talking about two or three. These is five for. For the general manager I think team. that they're all very important and I would want to do them I'm not gonna say they're all easy but I think I think I need to get them all done anyway this is doable well I'm gonna tr yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna make them happen but mm -hmm. I'm just saying I think they're all very important I think they're all very timely um, yeah sure and I, I would add to that, Dave, that um, I think except for the Ash Street campus evaluation, there are all things that Colleen has already been talking about and I yes. think would have done perhaps anyway. Right. So that's just my two cents on that question. Yep. Can, can I add something real quick? Just Please. Um, so uh, a little shout out for the first electrification is we have four what we're calling hoists, which is the homeowners. So. Um, you know, we're all, you know, have been homeowners the first time, 
and I don't know, but a lot of people, you know, they don't understand the electric system, who owns what, how does it work, what's the maintenance. And so we're, we run those in each of the four towns, and it's really a cool way for people to come in that are new to, to owning a home. And the first one is in Linfield next week, right, Chuck? Wednesday night at 7 at the library. And uh, we are going to roll out um, our new heat pump. We already have a heat pump, but we're, every year we try to make it better. So this year you'll get a little bit more of a kicker if you're lowering emissions. And then uh, we got a new one on um, electrification uh, on panels. So uh, upgrading panels, possibly smart panels, whatever people want to do, if you go from a 100 to a 200 amp, you know, there's going to be um, more ability for you to put in a heat pump. And, you know, I'd like to get those things in before the summertime so that people can take advantage of them. And, um, you know, we, we can also, it's a win-win. We could recover some of our kilowatt hour sales. So that will be in all four towns. It's all through March, but the first one is next next Wednesday at 7. We're and then we're at incentive people to increase their panel capacity? Yeah, it will be a rebate. Jeez, I, already did, I just did that. <laughs> Remove it. Reinstall it. <laughs> Phil, can you make a well, motion? Well, you'll have to. Name, shout out. <laughs> can we do a retroactive? No, I'm just kidding. No, we'll this is about me and my electricity. Um, the, the other part, though, is that after that, I'll be doing my round robins with each of the town board of selectmen presentations, and then we'll go to a bigger level of heat pump with you know commercial customers and the municipals, and we'll talk at a more of a municipal level at that meeting. After all those are done, if we, we still have a lot of feedback or at the end of the summer we want to run another workshop, we can. But that's kind of how that goal is being laid out. I just have one question. I notice these things got numbers on them, one, two, three, four, and five. Does that mean they're in order and priority? No. We could, we don't want to make a friendly motion to delete the numbers. Well, I, I, that, I mean, I don't know. No, they don't I mean, mean anything. Any big deal, but, you know, I just. It could have been bullets or yeah, dots. Yeah, I would have suggested bullets or, or dots or something. Other than it's easy to say, we got in goal three, could we talk? Well, certainly, that? certainly number one is, you know. Please, I mean. I have reservations about number one. I mean, okay. We do the best we can, but so far we've tried. We've made several attempts, and you know none of them we don't find a lamp. Right. Sooner right. Lamp. Right. We found yeah. sooner the lamp, but we can't seem to. Yeah. Well. Well, well, if it, it's it's worded to. Right. It doesn't have to be finished. Okay. Yeah, but. Right. It, we're just highlighting and it, we it all will dramatically just, affect your compensation if it, that goal is not hit this year. <laughs> yeah, you know that's in there, too. You know, it's unfortunate that, you know, you know it's a big priority because, you know, the biggest customer up there is analog. He's affected by this. You know, I, it just kind of blows my mind that we're, we're having trouble getting land up there. Yes, Tom? You know, yes. you could jeopardize your biggest customer at the, in the town of Wilmington. It's just amazing to me. We're still working on it. I know you are. Don't give up. It's still a goal. I know you are. It's still mm -hmm. the goal, and it's, it's may still happen. I'm not going to be positive. I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody here. I'm criticizing some people that are outside of this room. <laughs> Is it you? Yeah. Uh, no. Yes, yeah, so two comments. I think, uh, I mean, I think that's uh, feedback for, for we should hear. I think that, I think the, from the process point of view, I think it's good because uh, obviously general manager goals tend to be more challenging to, just as they would be for any person running the organization but by virtue of having it as a goal hopefully the I think one of the concepts here was to allow the board where appropriate to be helpful so by when there is obstacles which clearly there is providing a pathway for the board to help but what I really wanted to say it might uh, today's point uh, I think at, at this level they're fine but uh, in a subsequent review it might be helpful for Colleen with board uh, input to kind of timeline them because uh, that gives us a better tracking. You know, it's sort of like uh, when you give goals to someone in a company, they can all be due December 31, but <laughs> you don't know if they're late till December 31 at midnight, right? <laughs> so, but this isn't to micromanage calling, but more I think you can 
see if you find it halfway through the year, you know, it's hard to make progress in more than a couple. We know we probably <laughs> were more. Had well, a I, I understand for goals. we're going to quarterly discussions. Yeah, we'll be talking so about we're this. We're going to be talking about it. We'll be yeah, talking course. about yeah. it. Yeah. In April. But I mean, you, when you get through one quarter, there should be an ex. You might want an expectation. So where do we think we'll be? So, yeah. Because otherwise, it's. Uh, we don't want to be critical that we're late when <laughs> there was never a definition of was early or late. So right. Just a That's a good point. Okay. All right. I'm ready for the motion, Mr. Chair, whenever you are. Please. All right. Move that the Board of Commissioners approve the 2020 goals for the General Manager and the Board of Commissioners as presented in the Board Book. Second. All in favor? All opposed? That motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much, Colleen, for that process and for... I yeah, I think it was a good yeah. outcome. No, mm -hmm. thank you. Did we vote or do we have to vote on the board goals? We just did. We just did. did okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> what just happened. Okay. We folded it all into one motion. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Then make a difference right. to Tom. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a mo motion to make sure this is your last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to do that. <laughs> this is Tom's last meeting, and we failed to bake him a cake, so we'll do it at the next meeting um, without you here. Um, well, that's uh, eminently reasonable. Uh, um, okay. Sorry for uh, the long meeting so far, everybody. Um, so integrated resources. Um, Good evening. Good evening, Zach and Chuck. So, Mr. Hennessy, uh, yes. what did you upgrade from and to with your panel? You're gonna ask me a technical question like yes, that. Yes, I am. <laughs> 200 amp to 400 amp. I don't really know. Okay. <laughs> I'm not voting in any Two, retroactive tables. <laughs> 220, 221. Oh, I like that. that was, <laughs> <laughs> that's a Michael right? Keaton line. I'll be 100 to 200. I, I, don't, I don't know. Multiplicity. We needed to do it, though. You still have fuses? No. no. <laughs> then you are great. <laughs> it's all we need to have heat pumps and electric vehicles. It's all, it's all we need. So this presentation is not the typical power supply presentation, although I will say we just wrapped up purchase power for January, and um, transmission capacity and fuel is below budget. So we're already kicking off 2020 with a good start. Um, this presentation will be more focused on uh, power supply strategy as well as kind of our position and uh, future, say, requirements with uh, the Golden Bill. And then I'll talk a little bit about RPS and uh, CES. Um, so the RMLD uses a portfolio of power supply resources to meet the needs of our customers. Um, we do this with uh, including a combination of external and internal resources as well as short-term and long-term purchases. Um, so we've kind of created four um, main strategy points. Uh, number one is to provide stability for our rates um, and our customers. Um, number two um, is to provide this diverse portfolio of uh, sustainable, that encompasses our sustainable energy goals as well as uh, fuel type risks. Um, number three is we're balancing long-term and short-term purchases. So short-term purchases kind of takes advantage of uh, lower prices in the, in the short-term, what we're experiencing today, whereas long-term allows us to kind of achieve these long-term sustainable goals that the board um, and uh, Colleen set for us. Um, so the last uh, and uh, kind of what we do on a daily basis is balance this uh, peaking and intermediate and base load need. So our load goes up and down, so we try to stack resources specific to that load um, so we're not selling to the market or buying too much from the market, um, which could increase risks. Next slide. Um, so I talked about the external and internal resources. So we can split that right down the middle with our substations. Um, so external means you know large uh, centralized assets um, that are out on the grid. Um, those are, are nuclear, wind, hydro, um, large scale solar. Um, this is also say the New England market, as well as some of our bilateral products through Exelon and Nextera, and then our uh, peaking gas generator known as Stony Brook. Um, when we think about internal, that's behind the substation within our kind of distribution system. 
um, community solar projects, rooftop solar, um, our battery project at the substation, as well as our natural gas peaking um, project at the substation. Next slide. So when we look at our, say, portfolio out to 2030, um, you know, there's a lot of different resources here. Um, in this graph, you can see um, the name of the resource and then the resource type. Um, I've lumped, say, wind projects and solar projects together and hydro projects together. Um, but I provided on the next slide um, something that's a little cleaner. Um, we can see in the, in the light blue um, our solar, wind, hydro, biomass, dark blue, non-carbon, which is nuclear, and gray, which is mixed. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you might be wondering what mixed is. Um, so also we have this gray dotted um, line. So basically that's something that hasn't been purchased. Um, that's unhedged, so that remains on the market. Um, so you can see that's the ISO New England spot market, and you can see uh, the mix of that in 2018. So it's a mix between mostly natural gas and nuclear, um, but there's some other fuel types in there. Um, the gray here, these, these gray boxes are uh, bilateral contracts through Exelon and Nextera. Um, most of those are TFA. Exelon finishes in 2020. Um, these are TFAs we've been purchased, which have time and price triggers. So they're being picked up based on our policy decision um, for you know what we thought was a reasonable price and a reasonable time. <coughs> we also have our peaking gas generator, like I talked about, Stony Brook which are these smaller bars. Those of you who have been paying attention from month to month will notice that in 2020, the last time you saw this chart, we were about 70% uh, confirmed in resources. We have since made some TFA or transactions under the TFA that have taken us up uh, to uh, our goal for the year. So we're now fully subscribed uh, with fixed resources for 2020. And that's caused our, our um, say, rolling budget to decrease quite a bit. Um, we were modeling in a, a higher price for those assets, but it's really come down quite a bit in the short-term market. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can see this darker blue, which are, like I said, non-carbon or our nuclear assets. These are Millstone, Seabrook, and then rolling into 2024 will be next area chariot. Um, this is a combination between solar and nuclear. Um, so as we know, solar doesn't generate around the clock. It only ramps up when the sun's out. Um, so we've combined the solar with a, a nuclear asset to bring around the clock non-carbon energy. Um, so if we flip to the next, you'll see that again here, the next area chariot, that's the solar portion of that which brings into the light blue. So we have our solar projects, our wind projects, our hydro projects, and the polymer biomass. Um, next slide. So when we're thinking about all these different types of projects, um, they qualify different based on, say, um, the standard you're kind of, um, you know, trying to meet. So renewable portfolio standard um, is something we're exempt from, but there's an obligation for retailers out there, say investor-owned or competitive suppliers, to meet this. And, and basically under this policy, um, starting 2020, it's going to ramp up by 2% each year until 2029, which then it translates into 1% going forward. Um, so like I said, these retailers or investor-owned utilities have to meet that by, say, purchasing RECs associated with with that um, energy that they're purchasing and selling. Um, so those RECs, um, or Renewable Energy Credits, are classified in two different ways. We can see RPS Class 1 and RPS Class 2. Um, so Class 1 RECs are basically um, newer facilities um, built you know, after 1997. Um, you can see those technology types there. And then Class 2 are basically older projects. And you might notice the difference in price there. So um, class two recs are right now more expensive because um, the market's trying to value those older projects and keep those online. Um, 
So like I said, we're exempt from the RPS, uh, but I just kind of wanted to highlight some of those. Next slide. Um, so when thinking about where we would fit if we had to kind of meet that standard, um, so the green bars here show the renewable projects we're in, but right now we're selling the RECs associated with those projects to lower our power supply costs. Um, but if we were to keep the RECs and retire them, um, it would increase our percentage, which is this green dotted line, and this is the RPS standard, um, say by, we would be meeting it by 2021 with these projects that get RECs. Um, so that kind of levels off as we go forward, um, if you click onto the next slide, you can see that level off quite a bit. Um, so there is a financial impact on keeping the RECs rather than selling those RECs. And on the next slide, we can see that financial impact. Basically, this is our energy portfolio cost before, um, or I guess right now, selling the RECs. Um, this would be if we retired the RECs um, or kept the RECs. And so it's about $1.3 to $1.6 million um, in that year. So can I ask a question, Zach? So that would, if we retired the RECs instead, would have to raise rates to recoup this $1.3 to $1.6 per year? Um, so, yeah, so that would be, it would be more of like a fuel adjustment. Okay. How I believe the rates work. Okay. Um, but I, I've calculated that impact. We'll see on the last slide. Okay. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is just in that 2021 year meeting, say, above that RPS standard line. Mm -hmm. This would be the financial impact. Next slide. Oh, go back one. Sorry. Um, I want to mention, so this light blue um, solar wind hydro, um, we do not receive RECs for those projects. Um, some of those projects are large um, hydro electric projects that don't receive RECs. Um, some of those projects are solar projects. We've um, coordinated with the developer to say you the developer you can receive the recs to lower the PPA rate for that solar project things like that that we've worked out um, but the green shows the projects we're currently in that we receive recs but like I said we sell those so the clean energy standard so um, this started 16% in 2018 increases 2% every year that reaching that 80% by 2050. We're exempt from this as well. Um, this is not part of the RPS. It sits on top of the RPS. And the main difference here is um, the CES includes some of those larger hydro projects and then qualified uh, nuclear projects. Next slide. So the Golden Bill. So the Golden Bill um, is basically proposed or is being proposed or by the MLPs as a mechanism to acknowledge the RPS and CES uh, policies while um, crediting the nuclear investments that uh, municipal customers have made. Um, so when we look at the, um, the Golden Bill, you know, it's, it's defined by these facilities, but unlike the RPS, the Golden Bill includes large hydro and nuclear power. Um, so Is that the only difference? For the renewable projects, we have to retire the RECs um, for, the, for the nuclear assets. There's no, say, additional products we'll have to pick up. Um, but th that's the only difference. Doesn't the Golden Bill also uh, allow MLPs to retain and count as carbon-free power supply for which the MLP has sold the RECs to somebody else? I believe we have to retire the RECs associated renewable um, projects to um, account for, say, a percentage increase. If we wanted to meet the standard um, and say we weren't meeting that by nuclear energy, and say we had some renewable energy that we were selling the RECs, we would have to instead sell, uh, retire the RECs rather than sell the RECs. So, so we, I'm mistaken about that? Yeah. It used to be in there. Yeah. It yeah, used I, to be in there that you could count it even if you sold it. No, we, ha we have That's to gone? Yeah, we have to retire the RECs okay. based on the current language that I've talked to, to um, Vinny from E&E. &E. Uh -huh. um, so I, I can send you some of that information. You know
know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah because in the last presentation we had, um, it said we could say sell the recs. Right, that's gone. Well, I, I, I don't know um, if That was if a bone of contention, as I recall. That, uh, it might have been, like, early on proposed, but from my understanding now, we would have to retire those recs. Um, so the next slide. Um, so this is basically showing um, the, the dotted golden line here is what we would have to meet. Um, the black line is our total potential. So this accounts for our nuclear and our renewable um, projects that we receive the RECs, but we sell the RECs. But if we retire the RECs, this is what our uh, line would be. So we're, we could be way above this line um, until around 2029 if, like I said, we were retiring rather than selling. So there's a financial impact to being above this line, um, which we can see on the next slide. So I, I calculated the total financial impact of meeting that dotted black line, um, but it, our renewable or our um, nuclear assets would cover us until around 2024, 2025. Um, so we wouldn't see that total financial impact. And the CAB has asked uh, some questions regarding that, and I will make a list. If we go back to the last slide, I'll calculate what the financial impact would be to be just on this line. So I'll have that information by tomorrow, um, and I can send that out. Um, but this is the next slide. Sorry, to keep going back and forth. This shows basically at that black dotted line um, what the total financial impact would be. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't have to see, we could slowly ramp up some of these um, cost premiums, like I said, we wouldn't, um, we could meet it by uh, nuclear 2023, 2024, um, and then we would have to slowly integrate some of those renewable projects by retiring the RECs, and then by 2029, we would start seeing that um, 3.6 number. So I want to kind of lastly say, you know, while the base rate uh, may increase due to like labor, um, and material cost power supply is not projected to increase within the next four years. Um, like Colleen said, the capacity market has been going down, transmission has been going up, so that's kind of netted out. Um, and we're seeing fuel charges just keep dropping um, off the market and the TFA purchases. So we're not projected to see any um, power supply increases for the next four years. So I'll, I'll work on, like I said, the next uh, meeting that gold dotted line um, and showing that financial impact um, in the later half, so like 2025 and through 2029. I have a question. Yep. Anybody else have questions for us? Yeah. Go, go Dave. My question is, uh, at some point you said if we, if we didn't sell those recs, we'd hit the RPS next year, right, for 1.3 to 1.6 million. Decided, if we retired them. We would hit the RPS, and you said, "But we're going to sell the Rex." So I guess my question is, who decides that we're going to? That I know in the past we have, but who who decides? That, doesn't the board weigh in on that policy on whether we're going to sell them or keep them, and what our what our we we just voted a policy that we're going to decide what our renewable definitions are, what our percentages are. I guess what I'm saying is, I would like us to make a vote on whether we're going to sell the 1.3 million or whether we're going to hang on to it and get to that RPS now. Can I chime in? Yeah. That, that's the point of this presentation, so that we're preparing you yep. as the board to make an update to the policy. Because okay. right now, we have to meet certain sustainability goals with or without the RECs. Because some of the RECs, we retire because they're not worth any money. Yep. So we don't sell them all. So you, we want to, we want to educate everybody on the RPS, the CES, the Golden Bill, and again, those can, the Golden Bill can be bottom line. You, you can vote whatever it is that you want. We just wanted to create interactive slides and stuff so that whatever it is that you decide in your policy, because we have one right now, right, we're right. retiring, we're we're selling them right now because right now the policy says we can sell them. So. So you know, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to clarify is 
when the statement is made that we will be selling them, it's as if it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to do that. And that, that no, we can do that right now until the new policy comes out. But if, if you're about to make administrative decisions over the next months or whatever about those ones that you were referring to, it seems to me like the board has an opportunity to like kind of step in and say, do we really want to do that? Oh, I agree. But that's why when you look at that slide and you see everything that's open, that's why every month Chuck has been talking about we're, we're holding it open, okay. waiting for the policy. So it's kind of like we're, we're waiting. You're not selling them until there's a policy. Is that right? I, we're continuing to sell the wrecks. Okay. We do not have a statutory obligation or direction yet that tells us what our forward-looking uh, direction needs to be. Right. You don't have it from the state, but there's a board of commissioners that is voted by the That public. is correct. And you always have the option so, to step in and right. say, stop selling the wrecks. That's what I'm saying. Absorb the price. Yeah. Then make a motion, so then, take a vote, and we will follow whatever direction you give us. That's all I'm saying is at some point us. there's got to be a policy that the board is making, and the board is saying, what is our goal? Are, do we want to keep selling? I think it's a little yeah. The reason this, why Zach is doing this presentation yeah. so that if the board wants to make a recommendation based on this presentation, I'm going to take the existing board policy and I'm going to revise it for you and then present it to you and you can vote on it. Yeah, but I, but Chuck just said we're going we're to sell these as if like it's just this is just going to happen as a the matter current, of course. The current policy direction that we have from the commission is to sell the wrecks. All right, so is that a vote? Was that a voted policy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, yes. So we should look at that, and I think if we could hold off till the March meeting and take a look at it and see if we want to continue that, that policy or do we want to change it before, because the, 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 the train is leaving the station, right? As we're talking here. I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the train. Well, is I mean, I mean, the, the things are just happening of, as a matter of course, and I guess. We just ten minutes ago voted that we want to we want to be the ones to set the policy. So if we want to change, and you did it, set the policy. The policy was set by the commission. Yeah. I have a commission vote telling me right. to optimize Correct. profitability Correct. by selling the racks. I guess so. The the question I think that was six years ago, right? So the something question, like that. Yeah, yeah. So the question now is what I'm saying is I would like us to look at that again. So before, so before, I would like us to look at it again. Maybe the same outcome will happen, and that's fine. But I think, given uh, given the current events, given all the state policy, given that we just decided we want to weigh in, I think it's time for us to look at that again. Okay. Given the the clear slide that for a buck three we could be hitting the RPS right now, to me that's a question that our public should be looking at and saying, you know, what do we want as a community? Do we want to hit that now and spend the one three and it's cost another 18 cents on people's bills or not? And I think we're at a moment in our history when maybe people want to be taking a look at that. And they might say something different than what they said six years ago. Maybe. It's nothing, it's nothing I know you're following. The, the, only, the only thing that I would request yep. is that if you want us to hold Rex yep. now until the commission acts, that you pass a motion overriding the current directive that I have from the commission to sell Rex. I'm happy to make such a motion. Yeah. I'd also like to um, add something. So, yeah. Like I said, I provided the, the max number. I'd also like to provide the, the min number so yep. we could find that bandwidth. Um, so when I come up with just that meeting that gold dotted line, um, we'll know basically meeting the golden standard um, and then the bandwidth between the max and the min. Sure. So that could give some more clarity for the next. Can um, the chair make a motion, or is that not how it works? Well, Mr. Chair, can I yeah. speak? Please. First off, I'm not in favor of making any kind of motion here tonight. With Mr. Stempeck not being here, because I know Mr. Stempeck feels very strongly about. This reps. it would only be to it would only be no, to. No, I think you know the department, the policies in place, the department should continue on the path they're on. I don't recommend that we hold them up and, and do anything hold them up and running the department at this point. Nobody's holding up running the department. You're, well, you are. You're, you're saying to hold the wrecks. You're saying to hold the wrecks. I don't agree with that. Right now, you know, the department should continue continue on to run in accordance with the policy 
and then we can look at the policy and develop a new policy. Yeah, I think we have it in our goals to do yeah. that, so we right. should do it. Yeah. We have to. I mean, I'm in favor of selling the RECs because, you know, that helps the cost to the ratepayers. Right. And that's the reason why it was done in the beginning. And I know Mr. Stempeck feels very strong about that, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think any kind of holding up without him being here. That's fine. I, I take your point, Phil. I do. Uh, I do. Injustice. Yeah, okay. I do. As you pointed out earlier, climate change is here. Yeah. So, you know, I think the reality is upon all of us that we all need to do our part. So I really think that it may be time for us to revisit that policy. Yeah. Okay. So I, no I take your point not to do something at the spur of the moment and change anything or hold right. things off. I just would hate to think that in the next four weeks or six weeks, suddenly it all gets sold anyway, and maybe we, we kind of gave a signal that we, we might want to look at it. There could be, maybe there's three board members or four or five. Maybe even you in the next six weeks will we'll wake up and realize I'm the <laughs> <laughs> that, that not I don't mean that in the pejorative way. You, literally, you might wake up in the morning and say, you know, maybe we should do something different now. Um, things, things happen in the world. They do. Things do happen in the world. There's no truer statement than that. You know, who knows? With the coronavirus going around, people end, could end up yep. sheltering in place for two, four or five weeks. But that, I'm yeah. just saying, the Zach's presentation, that one slide saying that for a million three, we could be hitting the RPS like now, is to me uh, a pretty compelling piece of information. It'd be for a million us. three every single year, Zach? But that's an annual number. In that's just say for that 2021, um, we'd have to look. Because if you go back to those slides, um, so one more. If we drop down below that, that RPS standard, so we'd have to pick up additional renewable energy pro uh, projects or buy RECs uh, from the market. To I see. Increase. Um, so that's just for that year, 2021. So it would probably have to, I think I had a slide in there before I took it out. It would cost more over time. Yeah, it would, it would you know, cumulatively, yeah. it would increase over time. Hmm. Um, but these are all numbers I can calculate, um, and we can convert those into retail and CNI rates. And we don't have to have a policy of sell recs, don't sell recs. We could have a hybrid, right? We could do something in between. Yeah, exactly. And finding that bandwidth and trying to figure out where we sit and want to, want to be in the future, you know, these are all things that can be worked out. Yeah. So, okay. Do you think in the next four weeks it's all going to be moot because they all get sold? The next, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you mean by all get sold. Uh, wrecks are produced. They're usually on the market on a quarterly basis. Yep. So, you would be looking at one quarter's worth of wrecks um, that might be sold, and they would be 2019 wrecks at this point. Uh, so I don't think we've even touched the 2020 recs yet. Um, but I, I am glad if you have any specific information that you need to help uh, form your uh, positions or decisions, I am glad to have Zach work on those for the next month or so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach. <laughs> I mean, my, sen my sense of, the, my, of this community, and uh, Jason, feel free to weigh in. I mean, I think, I think the average person is willing to pay a dime more on their bill to know that they have a greener energy supply. Maybe it's 50 cents more. I, I don't think I, we still funded the projects that generated those wrecks. Whether we own the wrecks or not, we're still funding those projects that create the green energy. So I'm not s sure it's... Well, yeah, it's just around who's getting credit, f I guess, who's getting the credit to be able to offset their sort of bragging rights. Bragging rights, but it's we're still funding the projects that were green, that were that were generating. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I I, I always Mr. struggle Chairman, with that. Can I, Please, can we just go back again? The whole point of Zach doing this presentation is in preparation of an an updated policy. Okay, he's helping us prepare. For he, to do this, this whole work. thing yeah. is to help prepare right. for an updated policy. Okay, mm -hmm. to you know, not too long ago, the Golden Bill was you know everything was like really new. So this was Zach explaining what each of them are, what he thinks the impacts are going to be, so that you have all the information. And then after Zach's presentation, you say, you know, we'd like Zach to do this, 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 and this. 
you have all the information you need and then we can revise the policy how at the will of the board and and go forward I mean that's that was the whole point of this presentation right understood It's a, it's 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 a good point, Jason. I find the whole topic confusing. I have for six years. That's why I'm always confused. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I it, it is very confusing. We have some municipal light plants out there claiming we're 80 percent renewable or 100 percent. It's because they're buying recs and they're held out as oh they're the models or whatever for green power. And yet when you get into a different room like this one, we we're, the 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 vibe is that they don't matter because we, we if we have the money we can invest more. And it's like a whole different alternative way of thinking about it. Mm. And I guess I can see how both models are equally invalid or, or valid, both ways of describing it. Like when Hingham goes and buys wind wrecks from Texas or whatever they're doing, and they get up to some percent and then hold themselves out, uh, is that a valid way to operate and or isn't it? Hingham is buying market power. Yep. And as you said, buying the Texas wrecks. Yeah. And is now by definition 100 percent right green right um my position here is that rmld is doing more for carbon reduction and environmental improvement with the nature and structure of our portfolio and how we're managing our cost structure right to keep rates down than is somebody who is following the will buy the natural gas on the margin and buy the Texas wind wrecks to make it green. Mm. Um, so the whole wreck thing is 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 is, is, is kind of ruining the whole discussion because it's I mean it, it's it's it confuses everybody. Agreed. And it confuses me, it confuses a lot of folks. A lot of f folks feel this is the most important thing and yet if they're meaningless then why do we have them? Because it is a mechanism for the IOUs to be able to green up the energy that flows across their distribution wires yep. where they have no control over the generation sources that enter their system. Because they bid out standby power, because customers can buy from whatever source they choose, the IOUs need to buy the RECs to green up their portfolio, that's how they meet the RPS. They don't have uh, generation in their portfolio, so that's and what this is for. You could argue both for. ways that people do you it could. are good. And right now, because of the way the Rex market was originally designed and constructed to work for the IOUs and to hand through where they're no longer an aggregator, uh, it doesn't apply to the municipals. So we're trying to yeah. carve out in a very confusing situation. What we have done, as Jason pointed out, is make investment in the physical plant itself. It is a larger component of the cost of those projects than the value of the RECs. And we are doing, I believe, our bit to reduce carbon emissions. That's what our portfolio looks like. Whether we can label it renewable, carbon free, or yeah. something else. I just wish the whole REC construct didn't exist because it, it really has created all this. And like the, Phil said, the Golden Bill you know. is an attempt to reconcile current state statute with hoped policy okay. and that will give us a target that we can move towards and achieve and yep. we can present a policy to the Commission for what we want to do okay I, I apologize for dragging the meeting out I, what, what <laughs> it set me off because I see 1.3 million could get us up to the RPS and it said well why wouldn't we do that but um, that's what I read in that slide but 
Um, the only thing that I offer is, while it's a standard, yep. it doesn't apply to municipal light Correct. plants. I get that. I get okay. it. It would be optional. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, I did not mean to prolong the meeting. I, 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 uh, I did not succeed in not prolonging it. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for that discussion. I appreciate it. Are you guys all set? I just want to tell Chuck that I got a 200 amp service with four, a 40 circuit, <laughs> a 40 circuit Murray panel, and it was also furnished with an Intermatic whole panel surge arrestor suppressor. Oh, very nice, very nice. nice. So you know, so that's that email cost you. <laughs> this email cost a lot. Dave, you oh, you got to take uh, <laughs> the wife out to dinner now. Is that the deal? Yeah. <laughs> How much of the solar rebates, the MLP solar rebates, is left? Is that getting you know the state MLP. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what how much you're of asking. the money is left. If, isn't it at the end of the year? It, it use it or lose it. Uh, it is the end of June because it's a fiscal oh. year, and uh, if it's not used, it goes away. I just approved another rebate for 6,500 uh, today. As a matter of fact. Um, but it sounds like it's not all going to get used. No. Can I no, make a it, solar has slowed. How about if we ask Chuck to do all the, like, the rebate? Every every once in a while we, we do a, a presentation on all the rebates that we've mm -hmm. done. Yep. That might be a, a good yep. presentation. That'd and be then great. he can give you the totals. Uh, I'm going to be getting one myself, by the way, as an RMLD customer. A report? or No, no a solar on my roof. And a solar yeah, roof yes. rebate. Um, so wait, does that mean June 1 or July 1 of this year, that money is yes. used or lose it? Yes. Okay, well, we should put out a, some kind of communications around that because it's an opportunity to people to do solar. It's a great rebate. I can share my rough costs if anybody's interested, but it's roughly thirds. It's about a 15 grand project. I'm going to get about five from RMLD, five from the feds, and five out of my pocket, roughly. Hmm. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. You know, and if that deal goes away in, ju in July. So you well, get solar on your roof for only $5,000? I mean, those are very rough numbers, but, yeah, it's a small system. Mm -hmm. um, but without this state and municipal light plant, by the way, no, no special because I'm on the board. It's it's a publicly no, – it, everybody it, it's, gets it. It's available for everybody. Right. I do want to make, though, very, very clear that while the DOER program – ends June 30th. Yep. RMLD anticipates returning to the original solar rebates that it had in its program. Those will look very much like the commercial uh, rebates for under 25 kW systems. But it will be a lot lower than it is now. It will be lower, yeah. but it doesn't it doesn't go away. Right. And I thought I heard you say the rebates go away. I misspoke, as usual. But I, I just <laughs> wanted to be clear on that. I'm, I'm not trying to. Anybody who may be listening and isn't falling asleep, <laughs> both of them, that if you do something before <laughs> July 1, there's a big, nice, tasty rebate available from it, RMLB. It and does shrink a little bit, yeah. but it doesn't go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Okay. And for everybody else, there are heat pumps. Thanks, and again, thank you. yep, Zach, good that was a good meeting. Thank you. I will note this was his first presentation, and he had to look at the slides. I'm used to delivering without looking over my shoulder. Just saying. <laughs> but don't be looking over his shoulder. Zach, don't take that. It was a great presentation. It was. He did an excellent job. <laughs> okay, I made it. Good evening. I'm going to make it short and sweet because I know everybody is tired. <laughs> so this is not going to be a long presentation. Well, uh, the major construction projects, uh, the, uh, the project, uh, this project just finished uh, last week. So 3W15 getaway, that's a capital improvement project the board approved. And uh, section of the underground and section of overhead was involved. We basically pulled this circuit or feeder out of the existing uh, duct bank out of station three, and we rerouted it so we get better ratings, improvements. So that's the first slide. The next one, the major construction uh, projects. We got first slide, third party attachment project. 
that uh, it entails uh, approximately 90 attachments in Reading and 301 attachments in Wilmington. Reading is completed, and this is all, by the way, funded by uh, uh, First Light, uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, it's a f funded project. The, in the Wilmington, we got the pro approximately 33 poles to set, and in uh, Reading, we already set, uh, the Verizon already set 15 poles. But the rest of the poles we didn't make. We just had to make uh, them ready for the attachments. So this project is underway. We expect this project to be completed by May, April, May. So that's for that. The next one is the step-down upgrade. That's part of our uh, upgrade that we do in order to make improvements and the older uh, sections of uh, towns uh, in our ser service territories. Uh, this project happened to be in Linfield, the Thomas Road area, and uh, the project is uh, expected to be completed by actually tomorrow. Good. <laughs> so we are going to be. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the next one is the maintenance programs. We are right on target. It says tree trimming for the month of December was zero span, but actually what we did, we in the Thomas Road, Road area with the step downs. We took some huge trees out, so these are not trimming. We just took some trees out of the way, so we can set poles and we can, you know, run the wires. So that was done. Uh, the next slide is showing you the maintenance uh, programs, uh, the age transformer replacements. As you could see, in 2019, we replaced a total of 83 transformers. Uh, total transformers we have as of February 19, 2019, we had 4,000, we have now approximately 4,100 transformers, and uh, we got 15, uh, 24 transformers, 1,524, approximately 37 percent that they're 25 years uh, and all older. That's our cutoff for scheduling for the maintenance and upgrades. The next slide is showing you the double poles in town of Linfield, the North Reading, Reading, and Wilmington. You see the largest areas that you have to transfer that in Linfield and Wilmington for the right reasons because these are the areas that we are doing the conversions and doing the upgrades of those older sections of our systems, which should be making improvements. Uh, we got 23 poles in Reading for transfers and five in North Reading. So, so let me stop you there. I, I have an article here from the Cape Cod Times. It says we're supposed to replace those within 90 days under the law. Which ones? Are the poles? The poles. Once it's a double pole, right. the utilities are required under section chapter 164.30b, 34b, right. to replace those in for ni within 90 days. Do you That's find just on that Cape Cod because of the soft sand down there. <laughs> <laughs> beach there. There's actually three bills to put penalties behind yeah. that from what I understand. Oh, they may they probably go nowhere. Do you find that the case? Well, we we are we're pretty good at that. that that's what I, what I can tell you. Okay. <laughs> for transfers, uh, usually what we do, uh, we're waiting for uh, Comcast and Verizon. You know, that's what's taking the long time. Okay. Uh, as you know, we have a, a pole maintenance program that we test the poles, about 700 poles uh, every year. Mm -hmm. And we have three categories, the ones that they're condemned, the one that they fail or marginally failing. Not, it doesn't mean that pole is going to fall down. Uh, but it means that, you know, well, you're going to have to put it in, in the schedule for replacement. So we, the ones that they're condemned, we do them right away immediately. Those are the priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do the transfer right away. So our transfers, they don't take that long. But if we're waiting for somebody, do do they do they abide by the ninety days? They, I haven't seen that to be honest with you. They, it takes longer than that. But when it's condemned, right. do you call them and tell them? It's oh yeah, they, they know. They will come. That's why this program it's called engines. What it does, it's basically it says the ball in court. As soon as one transfers, it automatically notifies the computer, notifies that Verizon, you are the next. Comcast, but do they know if something's know. urgent? Oh yeah, they know. Okay, they know. If there is something that you know condemned and we, they need to set the poles, we tell them right away, and they move pretty quick on that. Yeah. But a transfer is a different story. We are right on the, the you know the time uh, within that. I, w I wouldn't say even nine days. We are usually you know trying to do the transfer within a month to the max.
maximum 60 days, I would say. That's our average time. But I cannot guarantee the others. As you know, Verizon, you know, they might, uh, they have probably one service truck for the four or five towns. So, uh, so. Can, can I make a comment? Phil, I'm going to write that down because, you know, that's another impact on the cell. Okay. So when they put the cells up, that's even more stuff that has to be right. changed over in order to get the double right. pull out. Mm -hmm. okay. That was one of the things we talked about down in Washington. Okay. Well, there's, I guess there's three bills to put some sort of uh, financial penalties behind. They're not going anywhere from what I read in the article here. But there's three bills that there'd be like a $20 a day fine per day after the 90 days for the utilities. So i give you the article if you want, too. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Good. All right. The next one is the reliability. As you see, the numbers for 2019, they're pretty good. We are very reliable. Uh, and that's what we'd like to see that. We are well below the national and regional averages. So uh, last year was a good year. Although you see the SADI, the, the, that chart right on the right, far right, uh, you see that, you know, we are a little bit uh, above last year, but over the, the past five years or so, you see that pretty much the average is kind of flat, but we're still well below the regional and uh, national averages. The reason this number, they jump up and down, because, you know, we have these transformer replacement programs, and as we take them out, you know, they require outage. So these are pockets of outages at different locations, mm -hmm. we, which we are um, uh, scheduling and we are making improvements. All right. Uh, the next one is showing basically your the cause of the outages. As you see that, you know, in the equipment, we're making great progress. So we're stopping those transformer leaks. We're hoping that we can get to get, get them all. But we're making good progress toward stopping those, uh, all the transformers that uh, they potentially, they're, uh, they're, they're going to leak. Uh, the trees we're doing well, wildlife, motor vehicle accidents gone up. That's something we don't, can't control. The weather conditions, we've had few storms. And considering all of those overall, with reliability-wise, we are doing very well. The system is getting better and better. But like what I've always said, we are not out of the woods yet. We've got still maintenance to do. We've got to build a new substation. And these are all the required funds. And that's what makes me nervous when we talk about, you know, the revenue-based and, you know, the payments based on the revenues and here, there. And I hope that you know that you know it, uh, we got enough funds, which I'm sure the board uh, that that would be the policy or the, the direction they're going to go. That's very important. In order to keep the reliability up, we need to keep the system maintenance and you know uh, talking about you know future investments in the new substation. That's very critical to the reliability of the town of Wilmington specifically. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure we have enough funds in order to uh, support it. Well, that concludes my uh, – and the next one is just the pictures of basically the projects in the, right around the building. You see that the facilities, the backup generator, the generator is going to be delivered tomorrow. That's for this building. And then we take in an outage next month to tr transfer everything and hook it up. The parking lot is going to be done in sometime in April, May. Uh, the roof, it's going to be done at the same time, April, May. So they're getting prepared for, uh, you know, the, uh, to, for the new silicon layer to be uh, deposited uh, to, f to cover the roof. And the deck repair is being done uh, by April, May again. We're receiving the steels the next week. And then they're going to get started uh, if the weather permitting. Uh, so these are all three or four projects. They're going to be done in the uh, spring. And we'll be done, uh, at least with those four projects. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hamid. Any questions? No. Good stuff, Mr. Chair. Can I make a comment? Uh, sure. So you know the deck? It's not really a deck, right? Because we're just putting right. in a patio. Yeah. So when we're putting in the generator, because the generator died, so we're replacing the generator. Right. 
they thought that there was an old stack and that there was a foundation, mm -hmm. but when they started digging, they were huge granite blocks, yeah. the most beautiful granite blocks you have ever seen. So of course I saved them. Mm -hmm. So when we build the patio, instead of buying the planters, we're going to use the blocks. Mm -hmm. Good. Recycle and reusing. Yeah. Wait till you see these blocks. I mean, they're huge. Really? And they probably were chipped away like in the 1800s. I mean, they're really amazing. Wow. So we have them stored out back the for now. They probably came from Gloucester. They had all the granite. I'm sure of it. Yep. The granite, and from the forms. quarry. So it was pretty exciting. Everybody's jaw dropped when they Let's came out. The I'll send you some yeah. pictures. So. Probably Colin, you're going to see Colin and I chiseling RML design <laughs> on the uh, rocks. I think the commissioners should uh, initially. Oh, they're super cool. It, it's, it'll look good around the little patio. Anyway. Yes. And it won't rot, I tr trust me. <laughs> we won't have any plastic or wood damage. Tom, do you want to have the floor for me? I do. I just want to, someone mentioned earlier, this is my last board meeting, so I want to uh, take a minute, literally, to say thank you to my fellow commissioners for their support, uh, friendship, uh, and assistance over the past almost six years, be six years in another week. Uh, let's thank Colleen and her staff who have always been very helpful and uh, deserve recognition for their dedication, successes, and I think innovative approaches to our, to our business. Uh, I'm proud of what we've done here uh, for our served communities of Reading, North Reading, Linfield, and Wilmington. Uh, there's four things I highlight. One is the security of supply, which I think is appreciated by all of us who are tax and rate payers. Uh, the focus on clean energy, the cost effectiveness uh, of the systems, uh, and the reliability, and especially when there are outages, the responsiveness and resolution, which I think is next to none. And I, I hope our listening community and all uh, uh, tax and rate payers uh, appreciate and recognize these. Uh, and finally, I want to say thanks to all the rate payers. I think all my time here, I know the board at large here has put the rate payer in the focus uh, and through, through which we look and the lens through which we look at all our decision making, including investments and funding for projects. So uh, I'm sure that will continue for the, Thank you. for the future. So Thank you for your uh, service. With that, I'll Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Hey, can I say something about Tom? Too? Please. Uh, I think, Tom, uh, you really embody uh, community service. And you, uh, not only here, town meeting, YMCA, and and I want to I want to say I thank you because you're the person that got me involved in RMLD, and uh, for that, I'll never forgive you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll never, yeah. never I, I, I remember never that. Great. <laughs> I do have other opportunities available, <laughs> Dave, for you afterwards. No, uh, your sense of humor, we, I really enjoy your, your humor on the board as well as uh, the way you can make a thoughtful point and take yeah. everybody's point of view into that point so we, right. it shows it's really heard. But you also stand up for things that you believe in. So yeah. great, you. great to have you on the board. Good. Yeah, Dave, Thank Dave you. just stole some of my thunder too. So yeah. I kind of feel the same way. And what you brought to the board, Tom, over the years has just been outstanding. I think I think the whole board thanks you for it. Yep. For that. I don't have any favorite board members, but. you. in touch. Two new grandchildren now, so you yep. got some more important things to do. Yep. Look forward to seeing you in town. So with that, and we should have made a cake. Maybe we'll do it next meeting, and we'll invite you here to have something. Okay. So, all right. From we'll the, the other side. Yeah. Right. So, Tom, I see you're listed to go to the cab meeting for March. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> said, oh, okay. well, maybe since maybe since I missed this one, I should uh, maybe you should put me in that one. I think that'd be illegal. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll come to our <laughs> meetings with public comment. You'll be, Absolutely. you know, leading our meetings. Oh, very Thank good. You, Tom. Okay. Thank you for all your support. Any, any more general discussion? No. Nope. Nope. Is there anything in executive session? Uh, yes, we're going to discuss okay. about uh, issues Just involving real estate. Real estate, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My only general discussion is thank you, Chuck, Jason, and Phil, for bringing me down a little bit out of my tree earlier <laughs> in the meeting. I appreciate that. <laughs> so That's okay. Um, but it's a confusing topic. So the next meetings are... Um, listed here March 19th, April 16th, and I think we're, we're good.
So motion to yeah, move that the uh, board of commissioners go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Okay. Second. Yep. Okay, thank you everybody very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.